I wanna wake up in the morning where the orange blossoms grow and the sun comes peeping in where I've been sleeping and the songbirds say hello. I love the fresh air and the sunshine. It's good for us, you know. So I'll make my home in Florida where the orange blossoms grow. Hello, this is Sally Parks. I feel so fortunate to have a person with us today who is a Pinellas County native, but also a good friend. His name is Ken Ford, and he had a lot to do with the Palm Harbor Museum. We're going to get to that story in just a minute, but welcome, Ken. Glad to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. Ken, I'm going to look, we'll talk about the history of this museum and how it got there, but First, I want to talk about your early life. So you are a native. Where were you born? And where I was did born in St. Petersburg. I went all through public schools. I graduated from St. Pete High School, went to St. Pete Junior College, I, and then I went up to the University of Florida, got graduated from there. With history majors along the way? Yes, yes, always in history. And mm -hmm. then later I went up to the University of West Florida in Pensacola and got my master's degree taught at the junior college up there, and then I went from there up to Auburn University to work and on my And did you did teaching and so on in yeah, the Yeah, I taught for times? a few years, and then I, you know, I also worked, got out of teaching and stuff, and then I was at the junior college. I always uh, teach or taught uh, during that, that period of time. Uh, it's like, uh, even, at, even when I was museum director, uh, for the county, I used to teach part time over at Hillsborough Community College at night and history. And mm -hmm. so, anyway, that's basically my background. Mm -hmm. And you said you went to Auburn working on your PhD, but you didn't quite get it because you not, are you have a special designation for that. Yes, uh, if I did, I had everything done: languages and prelims and orals. I did not finish my dissertation. And we used to call it ABD, all the dissertation. <laughs> so, no, because I started working for the county as museum director, and I did not have time to mm -hmm. finish anything up. And as time went by, I said, I I'm doing what I love to do, and I don't need <laughs> a doctor in front of my name to do that. So, well, so you're an almost doctor. Yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, we might get back talking about the early days in St. Petersburg, but. Let's, let's go on a little bit. So the first time you and I met was... Um, I remember it very well. Oh, so. do you? Okay, well, you, you lay it out, because I may we not were, remember it that well. When I first started working for the county, the county had a small little history museum in the basement of the old courthouse on Fort Harrison. We had three rooms, and they also had a couple rooms there, and you were the head of the Arts Council. Correct. You, we were neighbors down in the basement of, of the old courthouse, and I remember going down to your office and talking to you about the Arts Council, and you would come to see me. So we go back a long way, Sally. We do, and you know, I always thought there was such a great fit between the History Museum oh, yeah. and the Arts. So it's you know, it it was a great companionship. It all comes in under the to me the heading of humanities, exactly. and uh, you know that includes arts and history and. It's an educational uh, endeavor on parts of, you know, governments or institutions or whatever. And so this was in the mid-70s, and, you know, Ken, one of the things that I remember most was that I used to call that basement uh, the bowels of the, of the um, county because it was not a pretty place. No, and it we was... We really made the best of it. Well, it was, first of all, it was damp down there. Yes. Okay, because it was... Not exactly archival for... No, for your... because it was down below. It was in the basement. And, of course, in Florida, when you're in a basement, <laughs> why, it was always wet down there. So we used to kid around. We called it the dungeon down there. But uh, I was hired, basically, uh, the Heritage Park at that time was on the drawing boards. And it was a bicentennial project, mm -hmm. 1976. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I think about a week or two after I got hired, going out to where it was going to be, and the Boy Scouts had a troop out there, and 
they had put a little flagpole up and we had a little ceremony. But it was oh, all just pine trees. That and was palmetto. the beginning of it. Oh, that you was really the beginning saw of it. it. Wow. It, it's kind of interesting because what happened during the bicentennial year, the Junior League of Clearwater uh, wanted to move the Plant Sumner House, which is the first house got moved to the park, uh, to Coachman Park. Mm -hmm. They went to the city of Clearwater and the city of Clearwater turned them down. So then they came to the county and uh, the county said, well, we've got this 10 acres out there. And so, and Don Williams, the architect, whose daughter, Karen Seal, is a county commissioner now. Mm -hmm. I remember she got married at the park. Mm -hmm. uh, he Actually, had, she didn't get married at the park. She had a reception at the park. No, she got married there. No, she did not. Really? Yeah. Well, okay. I, I'll stop. But anyway, that, I, okay. you're almost perfect, so I'll that's stand close corrected enough. on that. Because uh, I remember it was up in the bandstand. Yeah, exactly. And, and mm -hmm. It wasn't in the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, uh, Don had done the, the site plan uh, for the uh, Heritage uh, Park, and it was a, a 10 acres. And later we got another 10 acres. And so uh, the Junior League moved the first house down, the Plant Sumner house, and then Williams and Walker Architects, Don, uh, the second house was Seven Gables house, which sat right in the bluff, right in back of the courthouse and we moved it down the Intercoastal Waterway. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then during that period of time, we we're also building a new museum there. So those are the first three buildings. And Amazing. That was and, and we all turned out, I got my kids out of bed to watch those, um, those houses be moved. I mean, that was oh, an yeah. amazing feat. It, That's all I can I say. I can't say enough about the house movers. They are the most incredible uh, people to move these big structures and my favorite story is when we moved the store, there wasn't any floor. It was just hex oh, really? <laughs> so they had to build cribbing to actually support and mm -hmm. sling it. Mm -hmm. And, and there was, somebody had left a Coke bottle with half Coke in it on the windowsill. Moved all the way from St. Pete to the park. That Coke bottle was still <gasps> sitting on oh, the window. Oh my goodness, Hadn't isn't that amazing? Over or anything. Oh, that tells you a lot. It, that to me said a whole lot because they really? actually had built the cribbing to support it. I mean, they, you know, you just look at all that and you go, it's almost hard to believe that people can move something and like that. that. And that's but they, so they, true. They, they were very, really? Roush house movers, I'll have to give them credit, mm -hmm. you know, were, were the house movers. They moved everything except for one building into the park. Really? Yeah. Mm, so. Amazing. Let me move back to the courthouse for just a minute because yes. the, you call it the dungeon, you know, right. I called it the bowels of the court, right. courthouse system. Um, remember the time that we had that huge rainstorm and you know the windows were all like wells so they gathered water and came pouring in Right. and I remember our stuff was, we didn't have valuable artwork down there, so we didn't have to worry about that. We had our artwork in other places. But your stuff was all down there, and I remember we pitched in to help get stuff up off the we, floor. We moved everything up off the floor because the floors were wet. Oh, they were soaked. I mean, they had inches of rain in them, and they were oh, yeah. pumping them out with some Well, the pumps. windows were kind of like ground level. You looked, they out, were. That's you looked right. out at the win uh, window, and you actually saw the ground, okay? Mm -hmm. so. But they were deep, so they had this and they nice were old, well in them. You know, yeah. and really. they leaked. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, all I can say is that we got through it. Right. You know, we What did you learn from Ralph Richards? Tell me about that. Ralph Reed. Uh, Reed, I'm sorry. Okay. Ralph Ralph started the Ta Yeah, tell me about him. Okay, well and then Ralph how Ralph you connected uh, with him. Worked for the St. Pete Times. He was the Clearwater branch editor, okay, and he retired. And then he got the idea of, he knew a lot of the old families in Clearwater. So he, his idea was to have some place where they could donate things, all their old stuff. And uh, so he went to the county commission and they gave him three rooms down in the old courthouse. This was mm -hmm. after the new courthouse was built. And so Ralph began collecting uh, things from these families and stuff. And he would have like exhibits down there Mm -hmm. And then 
But Ralph was getting much older. He yes. spent 40 years with the Times, and then he was... Uh, oh, so this was a retirement gig. This is a retirement thing mm -hmm. for him. I don't, I don't even know if they paid him anything, or if he did, they didn't pay him very much, because mm -hmm. it was more a labor of love. And uh, so anyway, I talked to Ralph on, on many occasions about people and, and artifacts and things, and uh, he, was, he was just a great old guy. In fact, there's a room, exhibit room, at the new museum in Heritage uh, Village that's the Ralph Reed Room, mm -hmm. and uh, we named it after him. So Very deserving. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, uh, I have to give him credit. We, you know, it took three big moving vans when we moved from the courthouse down to Heritage to move all the artifact, and he had collected those wow. over the years uh, from different families and uh -huh. stuff. So we had we had a decent collection. I think one of the most valuable parts of the collection he had like three thousand old photographs, early, mm -hmm. and he, they were all labeled. They, the names of the people were all on the back of the photographs, and he had them all cataloged. I mean, that, that is a very valuable collection. Absolutely. And right. a great start. Oh, Did yeah. he get some of them from the Times? You, you oh, suppose? I think so. I think that he mm -hmm. got that and also from the families Individual. and stuff. And, mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's a great collection and uh, you got to give Ralph credit for it. Mm -hmm. And he was, he, because of his training with the Times, he was good at organizing and cataloging things. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so I was very thankful for that. And so you were the first, probably first paid director of the museum. Right, right. And how long were, were you in the old courthouse and how long did One it year, take exactly. Heritage Village? I got, I got, I got, uh, <clears throat> I got hired in March of 76 and in April of 76 we got moved out to the park. Mm -hmm. So I was down mm -hmm. in the basement one year mm -hmm. uh, while they were building the museum and moving the first two houses in. So, and that's when you were down there. Yes, and a great acknowledgement for for Don Williams and uh, Williams oh, Don, and Don, Walker. Don, what and they his partner did. too. It was Williams and Walker Architects. Yes, his partner was Dixie mm -hmm. uh, Walker, mm -hmm. and they also uh, when they when we moved the Seven Gables house down, his company and some other investors, because they were going to build a big, uh, and it's right there, a big high rise where the house was, they paid for all the moving costs and everything oh. to move Seven Gables down to the park. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was mm -hmm. completely paid for by primarily Don Williams and, Dick, and Dixie Walker, their uh, architectural firm. So anyway, because like I remember there was there's something like 54 brick Piers underneath Seven Gables House, and they had mm. to pay somebody to come in and do all of those, sure. you know. So, and they moved it down the Intercoastal Waterway. They took it down to the uh, entrance to Memorial Causeway there, right, and we got it on a barge. Came down to Indian Springs Marina, just south of the Indian Rocks Bridge. Got it back up on land and brought it down to the park. That's the one that we watched go down. My kids well, watched know, it and that, they still that remember That made it. international news uh, mm -hmm. because of maybe two years after uh, we moved the house down there, I had a couple from London came over and they came in and said, they said, we'd like to see the building that, that moved down the river, you know, and <laughs> so, <laughs> and they said- You we, knew which one they were talking oh, about. Oh yeah, well, it's <laughs> the only one we moved like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you know, that meant that they had seen it on TV over in mm -hmm. London. So, mm -hmm. you know, we did get some uh, coverage over there too. When you look at Heritage Park, Ken, what do you think of as kind of the icon there? What is the one, that, one thing that you look at, and you may have a different perspective than others, but because you were there in those very first days, what do you think is the icon? To me, Seven Gables House, mm -hmm. the one I was just talking about. That's the, that's the biggest, it's it's the nicest. It's the uh, it's a, a very and it had a long history. Uh, both well, John Chest the history. Yeah, I don't know the well, history of it. Well, one of the one of the John Chestnut Senior and John Chestnut Junior were both county commissioners. Right. And John Chestnut Senior remembered living in the house uh, as a young boy. Uh, his mm -hmm. mother and father owned it. So. Mm -hmm. 
and then a, 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 fam a dental family, a couple generations in Clearwater, uh, they ended up buying it and they, the girls grew up as little girls, but they would come down the park and, you know, oh, that was my bedroom or Aww. I remember having dinner here. Mm -hmm. And I remember one Christmas, Publix did a, uh, a commercial and they wanted to use the kitchen with the old stove and taking a turkey out. And they did their, uh -huh. their uh, Christmas commercial mm -hmm. down at Seven Gables. Mm -hmm. So it's probably got more publicity. Right. More. But and the other thing that right, ranks right up there, though, is the Coach McMullen Log House. Mm -hmm. That's the oldest existing uh, building. It was built before the Civil War. And it was built by uh, the McMullens. There were seven McMullen families. It's a very large family here. People think it's one family, but there's, there were seven brothers, and they all moved. And when they have their reunion, there's seven books. <laughs> and it depends on which family you're in. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that log cabin was sitting uh, on, the Coachmans had bought the property from the McMullins. That's why we call it the uh, Coach McMullen Log House. And it had burned and the Coachmans donated it. We moved it down and we had to blast the logs to get the charring off, build a new roof and everything. Mm -hmm. But it's historically, it's the oldest building mm -hmm. in the park and mm -hmm. has a lot of history because of the two families involved. Of course, the Coachman family was very well known. They were in the citrus industry and the Coachman building, which is a five-story brick building, is right on the corner of Cleveland and Fort Harrison there. It's still there. I mean, you know, that mm -hmm. was their offices and We stuff. have roads named Coachman and roads oh, yeah. named McMullen and right. we, yeah, we know One the of the interesting well. things, people don't realize it, but uh, the McMullen Cemetery is right in fact coach and road goes right through the cemetery i know and there's some graves on one side and some on, on the, the north other and the side. south yeah but there's quite a few graves in there mm -hmm. right off of coach there and are road. yeah it's a very sweet cemetery actually to walk yeah, through it's a, it's a very old one and mm -hmm. and they keep it up mm -hmm. i mean the gallon family does you know they, they, do. they pay to keep they it do. up so and mentioning the seven gables earlier it is from the standpoint i think of of the staffing and and the community they have docents there a lot oh, yeah. of the we, time we, so we, we had wonderful to when i was there we had 350 volunteers wow. uh, not not all of them but most of them were docents people that gave tours mm -hmm. and uh you know because we had 20 buildings and you know some of them some of them you didn't need a docent in but most of them you did so, and you know, volunteers want to work a couple times a month or something. They don't want to work every day. So, but then we had other people that would help with our ar archival work or help in the library or help actually restore buildings and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Like mm -hmm. a volunteer actually did most as in charge of restoring the Coach McMullen Log House. Bob Powell, really? wow. he was a retired postal worker. Uh -huh. and he worked, came every day and I don't even remember if you remember CETA. Oh, yeah. The program that uh, was during the Carter administration. Mm -hmm. And CETA. C E T A. It mm -hmm. stood for. Uh, oh. CETA. Comprehensive Employment Training Impact. Act. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had like five CETA workers that would come every day, they were getting paid. The other good thing about CETA was they buy any equipment you wanted to go with and help the workers out. Mm -hmm. So we got all these power tools and stuff. To, but Bob Powell actually put that log cabin back together wow. with his CETA, CETA workers. So, if I could just mention CETA funds, that was how we funded much of the Arts Council too. Oh, I remember. And it was because Frank Bowman was very innovative and imaginative about how to use CETA funds effectively because we could prove that artists and craftsmen, like people that work with you, were in need of jobs and there weren't jobs available and so CETA, they were eligible for CETA funds. It, I mean, we had hundreds of thousands of dollars in this county from well, CETA, CETA funds. Well, CETA was basically a make-work program yeah, because kind we of were a in a WPA. major recession during the Carter administration. Right. And it was, uh, the idea was to get people to work in jobs hoping that once they got trained, they could get a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were willing to spend lots of money, the federal mm -hmm. government was, mm -hmm. through the CETA program. Uh, 
you know, in projects like Heritage Village or the Arts Council or mm -hmm. whatever. And it worked. I mean, oh, yeah? I, I, I've seen a lot of the people that worked with me go on to really find jobs and do it helped very a lot well of in people. this community. And, you know, uh, it also, it s itself created jobs, CETA did, because of administration of funds and mm -hmm. th there, there was a whole department formed in the county to deal with all of these uh, federal funds coming in. Right, and, that's true. Uh, so anyway, it was very successful, mm -hmm. good program. Ken, I assume that you take some joy in the fact that we are sitting in the Palm Harbor Museum, which you were very much involved in, but you look around this county and we have a number of historic museums yes. from Tarpon Springs to the Gulf Beaches, and we'll talk about each of those as, as you like. Um, I, I know they all struggle, and I, I take great joy in the Clearwater Historical Museum that is at South Ward Elementary School now, and, and I've been there and I've sent people there who have loved it and enjoyed um, Another the gem to me is, is the Dunn Eden yes. Historical Museum, yes. the old train depot, right. which is, that is done by the Dunn Eden Historical Society, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's well done, and, right. and uh, you know, they, they continue to thrive. The Gulf Beaches Museum now is owned by Pine House County government. The lady that owned the building donated the land, and there's a. And who was her? What was her name? Tell me Joan about Haley. her. Haley. Uh huh. She was a retired. Uh, she had worked in Washington for the Washington Star and was a preservationist in Alexandria. But her husband was a Secret Service agent. When he died, she moved to Pass the Grill and had a house there, and then the, the church uh, that. The, the museum is in the uh, old church building. It was built in 1917. The church outgrew the building, and she bought it from them. And that was her home for 30 years. And when she died, there weren't any heirs, and she did not want developers to come in and tear the building down. So we set a trust up, and uh, it, the county owns the property and the building there, and but it's completely run by volunteers. And mm. Uh, we we raised quite a bit of money. The, the friends of the of the museum ra raised quite a bit of money, and uh, so the main thing the county does is if it needed a new roof, which we had to do, or the air conditioner goes or something, mm -hmm. they pay for that. So. Some of the physical parts, yes, of it. Mm -hmm. but not not programming and no, not, no, no staffing. Nothing to do with staffing mm -hmm. or uh, exhibits or anything like mm -hmm. that. That's all mm -hmm. part of it. And I think you mentioned that Ms. at an earlier time that Mrs. Haley was. An early preservationist. Yes. What did that mean to you? Well, what does that mean? The, the preservation movement got started in Virginia, like you know Williamsburg, and but started in Alexandria. Alexandria is a very old, old city in Virginia, and they've got old churches and stuff there. I, I remember going, and one of the it's where Mount Vernon is, you know, Washington's home, and so anyway she got involved in that because it's it's kind of like a suburb of washington dc and uh, the uh she was busy like getting old buildings restored and things so she was interested in that when she came down here and a little aside she, she was uh i remember going through her papers we had correspondence from the white house grace coolidge was president coolidge's wife corresponded with her because she was the society editor for the Washington Star uh -huh. and uh, so anyway she you know donated the the land and stuff and because she called me down it was getting toward the end and she was very worried about what would happen to the building and so I recommended uh, that we set a trust up good and, for you and I got and I'll have to give her credit Evelyn Cutler Carl mm -hmm. Cutler was president for a long time at St. Pete Junior College and St. Pete College. Mm -hmm. His wife is an attorney, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. Evelyn wrote, the, got the trust together, and pro bono, of course, and uh, we, you know, that's how the county has possession of it now, and it's now on a national register, which means it, it can't be torn down. People don't realize it as if it's, if it's national, uh, historical or property, uh, the National Trust and everything, it's, it, it, 
is preserved only if it's owned by government. In other words, county, state, federal. I wasn't aware of that. If mm. it's a private property, you can tear it down. Mm -hmm. And it's happened in this county. Mm. For instance, the old sponge exchange in Tarpon was on the National Register. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It got torn down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a house down in, down in uh, St. Petersburg, same thing. The, you know, they wanted to save it, but the developers, they wanted the property, and so mm -hmm. they just tore it down. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that, like, the Hartley house will always be here mm -hmm. because... And, and let's jump into that, so, yes. since you're talking about the, the county-owned Gulf Beaches. Right. So let's talk about this house, the Hartley house. So tell me, tell me what you remember of that story. Uh, what I remember was uh, Winona and Charlie Jones, they, we were busy doing Pinellas Pass and other, uh, so I knew them. What was Pinellas Pass? Pinellas Pass was a TV show that we did for, we did maybe a couple hundred shows uh, that uh, we just, once, once a month we would do a show on some pioneer or, or some uh, historical event or something. It was a half hour show and they run on the government <laughs> channels and public uh, broadcasting and stuff. So uh, I was a host, but there were other hosts like Connie Madonna and, and I think Winona was a host a couple of times. Charlie was, uh, he ran the cameras, but he was also, he was the old pioneer editor. When we opened the show, he was sitting at our old roll top desk with his green visor and his oh, garter. I remember, on yeah, yes. that was great. And we had the music and stuff, so. But the Hartley House, and, uh, and I should mention Frank Pulaski here, uh, was, it was vacant and the heirs didn't know what to do or anything. And so the idea came up that maybe the county could get this property and we could start a museum here. And so basically that's what happened. I, let, let me just interrupt a little bit because I was sitting on the other side of it as an elected yes, official. Yes. So, so it was really Brian Smith and Fred Marquis, Marcus, who yes. said to me, and here, here's Brian, and, right. here, and here's Fred, right? Yes, and and they said to me, look, we're expanding the size of Belcher Road, and we're probably going to tear down that old house on the corner. And of course, Brian said, over my dead body, we'll do that. Let's figure out a way to do it. Talk to Ken Ford. Talk to the Jones, who, I mean, they became zealots, as I'm sure you know, oh, yes. with with saving this house and, you know, of course the Pulaski family did too because it was important to them. Um, but more importantly for really historic reasons, it, it did save I'll this give, house. I'll have to give Brian credit. He mm -hmm. was a director of the planning department for right. a long time. But he always had a very keen interest in history and preserving uh, That's true. part of it. Particularly up here, he lived, I think, in Ozona. Mm -hmm. Still uh, lives in Ozona, yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, He's always, I always enjoyed talking to Brian. He, right. he was always interested in the history of, particularly like when they were doing the, the, the Pinellas Trail and stuff. Mm -hmm. There was lots of mm -hmm. issues that came up about that. And, and speaking of the Dunedin History Museum, museum before, the trail and, and the fact that it was in such close proximity to the museum, it was really a big plus for everyone. Oh, and yeah. for the city of Dunedin, too. Okay, so g getting back to, to this... So, well, so anyway, we got... the, uh, you remember, the, the county uh, got possession of the property. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't remember... Tell, tell me about what the property looked like, because I think you were around here, Ken. It was pretty shabby. Uh, that's the only word I can say for it. It was a bunch of apartments, wasn't it? Or... Yeah, they had, they had rented out. They mm -hmm. had, I think, two or three apartments in the building. Right. It was in bad, bad shape. And uh, because it had been basically neglected over the years, the, the family didn't have money to take care of it. So, and it was kind of overgrown bushes around and things like that. So anyway, uh, once the county took possession of the property, and I don't remember, maybe you remember, it was how much money was involved? I do that? not remember that. Okay. Um, I wish I could. I should have checked that out with Brian because he probably could remember oh, it to the dollar. Oh, he remember, yes. But anyway, uh, then, uh, then the, the job became, let's make this into a museum and 
that required a lot of work. And the county contributed things like if air conditioning, roof, et cetera, et cetera. But really, Charlie and Winona and uh, other people, Reba Sutton, uh, Trudy, what's... Oxidine. Oxidine. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody kind of pitched in, and I, I remember I would be up here at least uh, three times a week, not for the whole day, but for a morning or an afternoon or something, helping them, you know, just trying to get it together. I mean, first thing was to get the, the kitchen and, and the uh, bathroom uh, redone. So that there were some plumbing issues, do I oh, remember? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There were some leaky uh, pipes and things <laughs> <laughs> that we had to get taken care of. And then, there, of course, there's code to meet. And uh, so we had to redo all that. And luckily, the floors, which are beautiful, the old pine floors here, they were still in pretty good shape. They mm -hmm. just needed to be mm -hmm. sanded and, and uh, refinished and things like that. But i got to give Charlie one. They were here every day from, mm -hmm. I think, 8 in the morning till 6 o'clock at night. Uh, A working. lot of sweat equity on their part, oh, wasn't it? Oh, thousands of hours, mm -hmm. thousands of hours getting working and and they would call me hey what about this or what can you know i remember one time we had a big load of uh, brush and stuff out where the the uh, parking lot is and the county had to come and cart all that away mm -hmm. you know, i had to call up the uh, highway people they came mm -hmm. in with a couple big dump trucks and loaded and old material that we were throwing out so and then, we, you know, once we got the, the building stabilized and, and got things done, you know, architecturally and, uh, you know, construction-wise, uh, then the next thing was collecting artifacts, building exhibits, uh, you know, training volunteers and things mm -hmm. like that. At that point, I kind of got backed off a little bit because then Charlie and Winona were, you know, I would help them with exhibits, for instance, but they, mm -hmm. they got the volunteers. They took on the leadership role. Yes, right. they did. Right. And, and exactly. you got to give, I, I just can't say enough about them. Mm -hmm. So we just have to look at the picture for a minute because there's... And there's here's Sally Parks. Uh, I know, <laughs> and there's Winona, and there's Ken Ford, right. Brian in the back here, and, and Fred, Fred Marquis. He was, and, he, was one of the, he was one of the best... County managers, I think, in the, I, in the I couldn't country. Agree. I couldn't agree with you more. He was. And I've also had the good fortune of interviewing him, too. He's a great interview because uh, he's got lots of good memories, too. But we have, we're really proud of that photo because it, is, it was the official opening of the museum. Yes, and I remember was, right out of the great front, indeed, front porch out here. Indeed. And, and, you know, you really planted some seeds, Ken, by... You know, following up with Brian and Fred, and and really supporting this effort to put together this house. You know, the and this thing museum. about Fred that always amazed me was, Fred would look at anything, it, not just a museum or the trail or something like that, but he would look at the money, he would look at the people involved, he would look at the politics, and and he would he would make it all happen and make it everyone work together to get that done where a lot of people just they just look at the money mm -hmm. you know well we don't have the money we can't do it so you know or that type of attitude and but Fred and Fred knew everybody I mean he did every mm -hmm. every community Fred knew who the players were and I think that's why he was so extremely successful. Mm -hmm. uh, is, and he put that puzzle together, never in a threatening way, but you no, know, we're going to be a team here, we're going to put it together and make it happen. you know, getting other people involved, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he, he just did a superb, superb he did. job. So, of course, we have to talk a little bit about Winona and Charlie, because they were such characters and, and memorable people in our community, and, and this is the book, of course, that Winona put together with great stories in it. It's available at the museum if people want to purchase it. It really does tell some, some good stories about, about um, Palm Harbor. You know, they're, they're an amazing couple. Winona, they got married when they were kids, they basically. Were. I and think she, she asked, was, she proposed to him. She, she was 16 years old, yeah. I think, when yeah. they got married. Yeah. And 
uh, and you know she raised her children and then she went back to school University of Florida she was a very loyal gator like me and because I used to see her going up to football games we'd pass each other on going up mm -hmm. uh, 19 mm -hmm. and uh, she got her degree and came back and taught school mm -hmm. and uh, and Charlie, and then went on to get her PhD in library sciences. Yes, yes, she, I mean, very, she had, very smartly. She was. And Charlie was just the opposite. He, I, Charlie, did not finish high school, okay, because he was a typical depression uh, person. He quit high school to go to work with the CCC, mm -hmm. uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, one of the Roosevelt agencies, uh, to get people back to work. And he, they would move them around. They would build parks mostly. And mm -hmm. I've been to two CCC parks that are still operating and good today. And mm -hmm. uh, one in Auburn, as a matter of fact, and the other up near Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Charlie said it was like the military. They would put up tents and stuff, and they had uniforms, and they got paid, which was important because he would send the money back to the family. And uh, and then. During the war, he worked over at the shipyards over in, uh, and it was a government job over there. But then Charlie became uh, a contractor. I think, if I remember correctly, he had the first contractor's license in Pinellas County. Oh, really? Yes. Ah, I never heard that. Okay. I think it was about 1953. Mm -hmm. Okay. But he was also in the insurance business. And the other thing, both of them, both families had been in the citrus industry. Uh, and they, they remember when they couldn't give oranges and stuff away. And Do you remember their orange juice stand and orange stand yep. on Alt 19? I yep. mean, we used to stop and get a glass of orange juice for 10 cents. Yep. Big glass. And, you know, refill if you wanted it. Oh, well, you know, like I said, you know, people actually had to let their property go because they couldn't pay their taxes. And, you know, and it was mostly citrus groves and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about this place, the Hartleys, was in addition to being in the citrus industry here, they had a ladder factory. Mm -hmm. Why would you have a ladder factory? Because if you think about it, you need a ladder to get up in the trees to pick the fruit. Uh -huh. uh, and so, and they weren't, when I say a ladder, it wasn't like uh, Ace Hardware or something ladder. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was a pine tree split down the middle, rounded on each side, flat, and they would bore out with an auger holes and put rungs in. They were just kind of like really crude, but they worked. And they were tall. They were very tall. Yeah. Because you had to, they would just lean them up against the tree and people would climb up the ladders to pick the fruit and stuff, you mm -hmm. know? But then they made a bunch of ladders for not just themselves, but for other people around here. Mm -hmm. So they had a little, little side industry. Somebody told me they made ladders even for the K pop tree. I don't know whether that's true or not, but you know, that I, is a I story that floated I don't know, around. I don't know the validity of that, but it would make mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. if you want to, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, the citrus, and, and there's another big industry, side industry of citrus is of course the honey industry because of the sweetness in the blossoms. The bees are all around, you know, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, I think that, you know, when we were, we at one time, when we were uh, working on getting the Hartley House here going, we actually contemplated kind of like setting up a, a, a ladder factory out there, you know, because of the history of the family. So Ken, tell me a little bit about, you know, we've talked about other museums, but the Tarpon Springs Museum is right up the street. Tell me a little bit about that. What do you what Well, do you it's know? in the old uh, train station up there, and of course the guy that for years and years was president and kind of the uh, straw boss, so to speak, was Ed Hoffman, the architect. Ed, Ed Senior. Ed Senior. Mm -hmm. And because uh, he grew up in St. Pete, but after the war when he came back, he moved to Tarpon Springs, mm -hmm. okay? Lived on Lake Tarpon. Eddie told us that great story about right. living on Lake Tarpon. Right. and then. I remember one of his major projects was the big new Pappas restaurant right there. Really? Yes, the old one that's, yeah, uh, it, yeah, you yeah. know, that for years and years was there, but he he did the... That the, was an icon in Tarpon oh, Springs. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. uh, he, but Ed was the architect. I for, didn't know that. For the, uh, 
for the restaurant. And so anyway, the Tarpon Museum is typical. It represents the history of a small town, Tarpon Springs. And they've got a good collection there of early Tarpon Springs. And Tarpon was, of course, probably one of the most unique communities in Pinellas because of the Greeks. Mm -hmm. And it was actually started by the Anglos, or back, it was actually chartered in 1888. Uh, the Greeks came in 1905, okay, and they were uh, sponge divers. There was a sponge industry before that, but they did it with hook boats. The, they came, had long poles with a hook at the bottom, and they would reach down and pull the sponge oh. off the bottom. Oh. Uh, and I know, like Chris Still's, uh, you know, rendering of all of this shows, you know, one of the big poles with a hook on it. Mm -hmm. And so, but of course, they're limited in depth at that point. You only go down as deep as, as that pole is long. Your pole and could reach, yeah. So in 1905, when the Greeks came, uh, they had the diving suits and the helmets, and they could go down deeper. And so they had a flourishing sponge industry because this is the day before synthetic sponges. Uh, so people that wanted them for, to bathe or wash or something had to use the natural sponges. and became a, they would have buyers coming from up north all over to the sponge exchange and they would have these great big strings of sponges hanging and people would bid on them and buy them and stuff and so uh, the Greeks became the predominant uh, ethnic and kind of center of uh, culture there in Tarpon Springs. So anyway getting back to the museum, uh, the there's a lot of the old Greek families, uh, and uh, they, there's a lot of information in there about the, the Greeks coming, but also the other, the Anglos, are, you know, the typical Florida crackers that were there before the Greeks came. And they've got exhibits, and they, they have programs up there. Uh, one of the ladies, that, uh, our Julie Kefalis, uh, she used to call me, she's a nurse at Morton Plant Hospital, but she loved the history of Tarpon. And she actually would call me. They would have the, the uh, Tarpon uh, Springs Historical Site would have a fashion show at Pappas's every year. Mm -hmm. And she would come and with a couple of her friends to borrow clothing from our museum mm -hmm. for the fashion show, mm -hmm. because it was a vintage mm -hmm. fashion mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. And it raised money for the museum. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I remember was uh, she called me one day about uh, an old schoolhouse, black schoolhouse that was getting torn down, going to be torn down in Tarpon. And we had been looking for an old schoolhouse for years to move to Heritage Park. And so I went up and had great big uh, orange lettering on it that said demo. And so I had to get a hold of community development because they were going to just tear it down. And long story short, we uh, got it moved down to the park, and it's there. And we have another schoolhouse, but this represents the African American schoolhouses. And they actually, they would actually move some of these schoolhouses around, uh, you know, hmm. from place. in the t in the same town or area? yes, or sometimes maybe to an adjoining town. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so anyway, Julie, uh, you know, I went up and I said, I had no. It was actually it was in pretty good shape, and so I got a hold of uh, community development that owned it at that time. Uh, they had get taken over the property, and uh, I think it was Darlene Collada was mm -hmm. the director mm -hmm. and Community development. said, do not demo that building. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we got the money together. Uh, actually, the county paid for it to move it down mm -hmm. to Heritage Village. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but getting back to the museum, uh, it's a typical, you know, uh, town museum where they represent their own town's history and they've collected artifacts and archival photographs and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, 
to, to me, Tarpon has a very rich history. It does. Because of the uh, Greek involvement there. The uh, Epiphany Day ceremony is a big thing every year. And we have a lot of people that come here from abroad that visit just because they've heard about Tarpon Springs and its, oh, yeah. uh, its culture. Well, and you got you go down Dodecanese, uh, the main street there, and you know uh, you, all the Greek restaurants and mm -hmm. St. Nicholas Boat Line. They have mm -hmm. pe take people out. The diver right. goes down right. and comes up with a right. sponge and all that yeah. stuff. Right. <laughs> the Bolaris is on that. Yes. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, it's 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 a tourist thing, but. Mm -hmm. It's certainly uh, interesting, you know, there was sponge industry going on throughout Florida, for instance, down in the Keys, but it was all hook boats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they were the ones with the divers. In fact, they did a movie back in it called Beneath the Twelve Mile Reef, and mm -hmm. it was filmed in Tarpon and Key West, mm. and a lot of the old Greek families were in that movie and mm. stuff. It was a big movie. It had Robert Wagner and Gilbert Rowland and mm -hmm. Peter Graves and... Uh, I forget who else was in the movie, but gave a good idea of of the, the Greek uh, sponge industry. And there's a more recent movie called Epiphany, which is kind of running in the independent film group, but right. it's also about not the Epiphany itself, although it talks about that and shows the the um, you know the excitement of the Epiphany Day, but also. Um, tells the story about the culture of Tarpon Springs. So we talked about um, the citrus, we talked about honey, uh, we've talked about sponge diving. Let's talk about cattle for a minute. Well, cattle was a big industry here because we had a lot of pasture land. I mean, you know, Pinellas is flat, got a lot of grass because of the weather and stuff here. And so there was like two families I remember, like the Starkey family. Starkey Road is a major road in mm -hmm. the county now, mm -hmm. but Jay Starkey uh, had a, hundreds of cattle and he drove it up what is now Starkey Road and his house was right on Starkey Road there. And uh, the other was Al Boyd. Boot East Ranch. Lake area. Yep, mm -hmm. that's north. Starkey's more a middle mm -hmm. Largo, mm -hmm. uh, North St. Pete area. And, and uh, Boyd, uh, he had uh, thousands of cattle up there and had a huge ranch called Boot Ranch. They were kind of free range, weren't they? I mean, oh, they yeah. didn't even fence there's, them there was, there was actually cattle rustling going on. I mean, they, it was like the old west out here, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, people would steal cows and they'd chase them, you know, and they got shot and stuff like that. And uh, our, our, one of my classmates at St. Pete High, Rosemary Otten, uh, her dad, actually was a trapper and would work for Al Boyd catching wild hogs. Wild hogs mm -hmm. were a big problem uh, because they tore up stuff and mm -hmm. they were kind of a nuisance and things. So And they're mean. And they're mean, <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, the cattle industry was big and Al was the first one to introduce the uh, Brahmin cattle. They were very uh, resistant to insects and heat and they came from India and he had them shipped over here and then bred them. And that got to be such a big industry, he was actually selling the, uh, they were kind of uh, bred with the local cows and stuff, sell them down in Central America, mm -hmm. breed them down there. Because like I said, they were heat resistant and insect resistant. And, but there are a lot of cowboys, you know, a lot of cattle, and uh, it was a major industry here. And we have books on both Al Boyd uh, and and on Jay Starkey here at the museum because they were they were as you say they were true pioneers for this. Oh yeah, they they were county. here when it was, everything was open and there weren't any mm -hmm. fences or anything. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it was kind of like uh, I, I I remember interviewing uh, Al Boyd. I did a Pinellas Pass show with Al Boyd, and but anyway. He had all these holsters and stuff and guns, you know, because of the rustlers and stuff like that. And, you know, it was, people don't realize it, but Florida was the largest cattle raising state east of the Mississippi River uh, mm -hmm. because we had all this huge flatland area, mm -hmm. particularly out around Kissimmee mm -hmm. and uh, that, you know, the mm -hmm. big industry out there. So, but we had it here too. Right. So, Ken, let's circle back. We're, we're talking about history of 
long ago, uh, and I know you didn't personally. I'm well, not that old, Sally. And that's what I was going to say. You weren't, you weren't old enough to be uh, one of the earliest pioneers, but you did grow up here, and you had an interesting early experiences. So you lived in St. Pete uh, as a kid. Yeah. Um, what did kids do in St. Pete? I mean, you know, just went, like I said, staying in the house and watch TV? No, no, there wasn't any TV no when TV. I was growing up. Okay. Pinellas did not get a, a, their first TV uh, station was around 19... Uh, 56 somewhere in there 50 55 whatever before that we didn't have any television mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. had radio I would listen to there were like gun smoke and stuff on the radio but that was at night so we were outdoors most of the time we uh, there wasn't anything to do in the house and you know we pick up ball games you know baseball uh, basketball whatever play cowboys or Indians or whatever, and you know, we'd go swimming and... Uh, Where'd you swim in the uh, golf? Swam, well, if you lived out toward the beaches, you did, but if you lived in town, you swam in the bay, mm -hmm. and, uh, which wasn't as polluted as it is today. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, like there was a public dock at 17th Avenue South, and I, my brother and I had gotten an old rowboat and we worked and worked on it had three coats of paint i think and uh we would didn't have any motor we all we had was oars but we'd go and get in our boat row out to lewis island which is coquina key today and always had a can to bail water out because it leaked and uh, you know you got kind of tired row, row. <laughs> i mean we were only like i think about 10 or 11 years old so mm -hmm. uh but we we get out there and we spend a day out there. My mother never really worried about us, anything happening to us. So, and we were pretty typical of you know back in those days. Kids did their own thing. They they would make, you know how kids are. They 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 will create. I think one of the sad things today is all the video games and everything. It's not creative. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's technologically uh, interesting, but. We, we could make something out of nothing. We could make like a scooter out of an old pair of skates and a board, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that, uh, <laughs> that these kids have to go down and buy it at Walmart or something, you know, <laughs> so. So you, I think you told me about being invited to um, a Sunday dinner. Oh. And, and that was kind of like what it was like back in the day. Well, I, I always tell this story about old Florida crackers uh, after church they would invite you to, to back to the house for dinner and usually it was fried chicken and mashed potatoes and you know collard greens and all the trimmings and stuff and and uh, my story is you got a free dinner send you home with a big bag of oranges okay or grapefruit and maybe some old reader's digest they have <laughs> that they read Aww. 25 times and but you didn't ask them for a nickel <laughs> because they didn't have it. They didn't have it. No, people did not have hardly any money. It was back. depression times and, and even, later. Yeah, it didn't the change much 40s. here until the World War II. Mm -hmm. You know, then mm -hmm. the troops coming in and, you know, the war and everything, why people start having more money. And then there was a big boom after the war, building boom. Uh, a lot of GIs that had been up, grew up, came down here and were stationed down here and they loved it. So after the war was over, they came back. And so the big housing boom after that. Because St. Pete was like a bedroom community for the airfields over in Tampa. Mm -hmm. They did not have enough housing in Tampa mm -hmm. for all of the troops mm -hmm. stationed there. Mm -hmm. And they would actually bus them over or they would, it's like for instance, uh, both Gandhi Bridge and the old Davis Causeway, which is now Courtney Campbell, those were toll roads. Well, when the war started and the guys were living in St. Pete and driving to Tampa, they took the toll, the government took over and took the tolls off those roads. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Ah. And uh, they actually took possession of, them, of the stuff and so that the guys could go back and forth. And like all the old hotels downtown St. Pete, they were full of troops and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, <laughs> the Davis family, which owned 
uh, the Davis Causeway, they lost that after the mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. The government mm -hmm. took possession and they never got it back. Mm -hmm. That's why a little portion over in Tampa is Davis Beach over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the family that owned it. And then they renamed it to Courtney Campbell. So, but uh, that was all, you know, like I said, there's hardly any money back in those days. I mean, people just, it's like, the other story is families would come down here and they'd be here for a while and they couldn't make it financially and they'd go back north, go home. And then they weren't used to cold winters anymore. And after a while, well, it wasn't so bad in Florida, so we'll go back, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we'll make it Sometimes work. Sometimes it took two or three trips. Mm -hmm. and they, mm -hmm. So actually, we got paid a little bit of money and a lot of sunshine mm -hmm. is what it amounted to yeah. down here. So Ken, what is your legacy? Mine personally? Or yes, I, personally. Well, my, I, I feel like I've contributed uh, to preserving the history of Pinellas County. I and, think that's exactly right. You and, just and, nailed it. And, you know, uh, I didn't do it all. I mean, everyone, lots and lots of people have been involved in all of these projects. I don't care what museum it is or uh, what uh, group, organization it is. Uh, everyone has worked. My, I think I see my role as someone that could kind of direct or help, uh, you know, and and maybe initiate some stuff. But I didn't do the work. A lot of, I did. I I work, but it was really all the volunteers mm -hmm. and the organizations, and it's still true today. Mm -hmm. It's they're the ones that are you know carrying on this this preservation and, and of our history and our culture here. So here's my final question. Ken Ford is, complete this sentence. Ken Ford is a retired historian. <laughs> All right, that's a good one. Ken Ford, it's been really a pleasure to have you. Retired historian leaving a legacy of, of starting and, and helping to maintain lots of good history for Pinellas County. Thank you for that. I, was, I, I enjoyed doing that. It was a great job. Good. I want to wake up in the morning Where the orange blossoms grow And the sun comes peeping in where I've been sleeping And the songbirds say hello I love the fresh air and the sunshine It's good for us, you know So I'll make my home in Florida Where the orange blossoms grow